The Night Beat starts right now. The COVID-19 surge continues here in Bear County tonight. 495 new cases announced, pushing our total far past the 10,000 mark. Two new deaths also reported. Our death toll now stands at 109. Hospitalizations also continuing to increase. Right now, there are 802 patients in local hospitals. That's 72 more than yesterday. 265 of those patients are in the ICU and 138 are on ventilators. 3,150 patients have recovered so far. With Texas bars forced to close down again in an effort to slow the spread of COVID-19, the Texas Bar and Nightclub Alliance has said it plans to file lawsuits in the state and federal courts this week. The night team's Garrett Berger talked with two bar owners tonight about the upcoming suits and what might happen next. Closing down her bar, Lucy Cooper's Ice House again in the wake of Governor Abbott's latest order on Friday. Rhonda Smith is one of many frustrated Texas bar owners. You know, we woke up to just a, a blow that took our knees out from under us. No one was really expecting that. Now the Texas Bar and Nightclub Alliance is planning to try for a temporary restraining order to end what it calls the governor's overreach. Smith wouldn't say if she's a TBNA member or comment if she was considering joining with lawsuits but she's supportive of its efforts and would love to see it win. I would also love to see a work together action plan between our businesses and the governor's office to work together to come up with some compromise. So two weeks from now, we don't see the same thing happen again. The TBNA has also said it supports its members protesting the order by staying open. But bars that do that could risk fines or suspension of their TBA licenses. Martini Club owner Robert Benovi says he talked with his own attorney on Friday, separate from TBNA's efforts, and found that those punishments may be necessary to get standing for a case. He was stating to be constitutional and to sue that I need to actually open up and fight the whatever sanction I get. Benovi is still considering whether he'll take that step, saying it comes down to if he can survive. At some point, I'm going to run out of money. And if if I if me keeping the doors open to pay my way, like to to provide for my family, that's I've got to do it. We reached out to the executive director of the TBNA earlier today. However, he said he had no comment. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. President Trump wanted us to be here today with the developments over the last two weeks, with the rising positivity and the rising number of cases with a very simple message, and that is to you, to the people of Texas, we're with you, and we're going to stay with you. Amid the surge of COVID-19 cases here in Texas, Vice President Mike Pence traveled to Dallas today for a rally with Governor Greg Abbott, during which Pence praised Abbott for both his decisions to reopen the state and then roll back that opening. Pence also encouraged taking the proper actions to slow the spread. Roughly half the state is under local ordinances. Strongly recommend if, you're, if your local officials in consultation with the state uh, are directing you to wear a mask, we encourage uh, everyone to wear a mask uh, in the affected areas and where you can't maintain social distancing. The vice president's visit, not without criticism, more than 100 choir members sang without masks during the event at a megachurch today. The CDC says coronavirus is especially likely to spread when people are singing because it travels on respiratory droplets. As for social distancing, organizers say about 2,200 people were packed into the 3,000 seat church. New on the night beat, some tragic news to report. The Kerr County Sheriff says a child's body has been recovered from the Guadalupe River. Sheriff Rusty Hierholzer says the child was riding in either a canoe or kayak sometime this afternoon when it flipped over, tossing that child into the water. It reportedly less than two years old, that child. The sheriff believes it happened on the river somewhere between the towns of Hunt and Ingram. We don't have any more details right now, but we do know that Texas Parks and Wildlife is handling the investigation. Also new tonight, a man's in the hospital after flipping his car and getting pinned underneath it. The crash happened around 7.30 tonight near Pleasanton Road and Gladstone Avenue. Witnesses told police they saw the man speeding around the corner. They say he lost control and was thrown from the truck. He was taken to the hospital with life-threatening injuries. Police say the man was also a suspect in a domestic assault call in the area. No word yet if he'll be facing any charges. They are two men who credit the staff at Brook Army Medical Center with providing excellent care in their time of need. But both now say the financial side of their respective hospital stays has created problems they continue to deal with long after they were released. 
The night team's Dylan Collier examines the complications in this Defender's report. Um, I was wearing full gear like I was supposed to, helmet and everything. We always did. And as Chris Dykeman rode to meet up with other members of his motorcycle club two years ago, that helmet likely saved his life. A full-size Chevy truck nailed Dykeman at Topper Wine and Lookout Road, pinning him between the truck and bike, which was dragged before he was tossed from it. Hit a curb, bounced off the curb, and slid into a field, and actually it was a fence the fence line that I crashed into. Dykeman's injuries. Basically laying the leg completely open. Some of which are still visible, included a badly damaged leg, back and arm fractures, and a rib cage that collapsed, lacerating the lung, which then also collapsed. He would spend nearly 70 days at Brook Army Medical Center, much of that time in its intensive care unit. Because of recurring infections, he would make four more trips to Bamsey. Dykeman did not have health insurance. Basically, we ended up with three bills that were in the six-figure range and multiple little bills anywhere from 1000 to 60000 every stint. Which, 60000 is a little bill. I, I mean, well, that's little when you see the ones yeah. that were as big as what, yeah. what they were. All told, Dykeman says his bills topped $1.2 million. Since he's a civilian who received treatment at a military hospital, he is responsible for the full amount which Bamsey turned over to the U.S. Department of the Treasury, which recently turned it over to a collection agency. That's a, a, such an astronomical amount of money. Uh, I would probably never make that up in my lifetime. I opened this, and it was just smoke. Yeah. Luckily for Brenton Ferguson, he had health insurance when he suffered second-degree burns in a garage fire in late 2018. Ferguson, barehanded and barefoot, tossed several items that were on fire into the driveway of his stone oak home before rushing inside to save his children. I looked over and this whole hand was just like blistered and peeling off. Um, both of my, or my other hand, the fingertips were blistered up. And at that point, I was like, oh, my feet hurt. Although Ferguson's stay at Bamsey's burn unit was brief, not even being the spouse of a Bamsey employee could prevent him from later encountering billing problems. Their confusion in their um, administration caused this issue. Bamsey officials declined our request for an interview for this story and in a statement defended their handling of Ferguson's case, claiming they billed his insurance within filing deadlines and handed over the remaining debt to the U.S. Department of the Treasury only after it hadn't been paid in full and no payment plan was arranged. Ferguson, meanwhile, says the hospital flat out forgot to charge his insurance for his overnight stay and claims it then couldn't give him a straight answer on what portion of bills he still owed, despite call after call after call being made to its billing department. This went on for like months and months and months. The result? He and his wife's tax return was seized in April and their credit has been damaged. We've never contested paying it, we just wanted to know what we owed. And the fire actually sat right here. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Ferguson has filed an appeal with the Treasury Department for the $5,200 owed, but now says that hasn't moved forward because the government is waiting on Bamsey to respond. Other top stories we're following tonight. Police have arrested the man they say is responsible for a shooting at shooting at at least eight people at Rebar on Broadway earlier this month. The suspect, 37-year-old Janelius Crew, was arrested in Florida after officers saw him leaving a hotel room. Crew is now back in Bear County and is facing multiple charges in connection with the shooting. Police say Crew fired gunshots outside the bar before running away. Police say right before the shooting, he and a group of friends had walked to Rebar from another bar nearby. The group was denied entry multiple times because they were allegedly too drunk. The Comal County Sheriff's Office investigating after a man was found dead on the side of the road this morning. That man's body discovered around 10 a.m. in the 4,000 block of South Cranes Mill Road in Canyon Lake. According to the Comal County Sheriff's Facebook page, the man appears to be in his 40s and is believed to have suffered a neck injury. Anyone with information in this case is urged to contact deputies. Their number 830-620-3400. We support the blue. That was the message coming from more than 100 people gathered outside the San Antonio Public Safety Headquarters building this afternoon. The group marched through downtown before arriving there, chanting, defend the peacekeepers, they defend us. One of the organizers told our crew on scene that demonstrators wanted to show officers they had their backs and they were not okay with the public showing police hate. 
I just hope that the citizens will see this and wake up. I mean, sometimes you've got to stand up for right, and this is right. You don't want to defund our department. You want to let our men and women on the street know that we love them and know that we support them. The demonstration follows weeks of protests in San Antonio and around the nation denouncing police brutality in the wake of George Floyd's death in Minneapolis. Local calls for reform have included changing the discipline process for officers and defunding the police. Outside with live cam, 83 degrees in this 10 o'clock hour. We've still got plenty of clouds out there as well, but not as hazy today. And even tonight, easier to see the lights of downtown over San Antonio. That Saharan dust did begin to thin out a good bit today, and that trend will continue tomorrow. High temperatures today, 92 in San Antonio, upper 80s in the hill country, but it did get to the century mark down in Catula, 100 degrees, 99 in Carrizo Springs, 98 in Del Rio. Even here in San Antonio, we will see our high temperatures steadily climb closer to 100 degrees over the next few days and as we approach the 4th of July holiday. We'll talk more about the heat settling in and I'll get you a look at your forecast for the week ahead coming up in just a bit. Still ahead on the night beat, President Donald Trump denying he was ever briefed following a New York Times report stating Russia was looking to pay the Taliban to kill U.S. troops. His response, garnering criticism out of Washington. Plus, we're taking a second look at this morning's leading essay interview on GMSA. A local doctor explains why the recent surge in COVID-19 cases could still grow far worse. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Seven states breaking records for new COVID-19 cases today, including Texas. Yeah, this is more governors across the nation tighten up restrictions to get a handle on the spike in cases. ABC's Zoreen Shaw is in Houston tonight with the details. This weekend, 10 million people infected and more than 500,000 worldwide who've lost their lives to the coronavirus. In the U.S., seven states breaking records this weekend, including Florida with nearly 9,000 new infections. Broward County and Miami-Dade closing beaches ahead of Independence Day festivities. Bar owners frustrated closing for the second time. We burned through 90% of our savings during the first shutdown, keeping this place alive. Um, and it's just, at what point will this end? And masks became mandatory in Pensacola, but Florida's governor has not issued a statewide mandate attributing numbers to younger people. You're seeing it in those groups who are less at risk, uh, but you're seeing them test positive at much higher rates. Over in Texas, Vice President Mike Pence wearing a mask at his Dallas event, and for the first time, forcefully encouraging a crowd of over 2,000 to do the same. Wearing a mask is just a good idea. Uh, and it will, we know from experience, uh, will slow the spread of the coronavirus. Deborah Burks also adding that wearing one is not just about protecting others. We know now there's scientific evidence that masks both keep you from infecting others, but may also partially protect you from getting infected. I think that's a new discovery and a new finding. Cases in Texas topping 5,300 on Sunday, surpassing 5,000 for the sixth day in a row. This video showing Texans crowding into a nightclub Saturday. The owner telling our Houston station they did not shut down because they consider themselves a restaurant. Capacity at restaurants recently limited by the governor and bars where COVID can easily spread shut down once again. Cases also going up in Nevada. Less than a month after Las Vegas casinos opened, a Caesars Palace employee has lost his life after testing positive for the virus. In neighboring California, the state now closing bars for a second time in at least seven counties, including Los Angeles, as cases continue climbing there. People are not wearing masks as much as they were before. Zorin Shah, ABC News, Houston. A little better look out there today. You could actually see more than, I don't know, 20 feet in front of you. Right. <laughs> yeah, a big difference. And there was still a little bit of lingering dust today, but yeah. it looked like a completely different place today than yesterday. That's the good news. We also saw a big improvement in air quality today with that Saharan dust beginning to thin out a bit. And again, that trend will continue into tomorrow, but we are not done with the dust just yet. Today's time lapse. We still had plenty of clouds around today, just like yesterday, but you'll notice in the afternoon, a little bit of blue sky there and even some 
shower activity pacing through portions of South Texas today. Uh, we wound up with a low temperature of just 80 degrees, but uh, into the low 90s this afternoon, 92 your afternoon high temperature there, and we'll see those afternoon temperature numbers. They will really start to trend up here over the next few days. Temperature wise now 83 at the airport, upper 70s, low 80s in the hill country, still toasty off to the west, 88 in Del Rio and still 90 degrees in Carrizo Springs at this hour. And I do want to give you a quick radar update. We did have some showers develop over parts of San Antonio and Bear County earlier this afternoon, and then a lot of the activity was focused from Wilson County up to Seguin, New Braunfels as well. But as the evening went on, thunderstorm activity really concentrated north of San Marcos up to the Austin area. At times, we had a flash flood warning for a portion of Bastrop County there, but that's just out of the KSAP viewing area. So we were just a county or so away uh, from a portion of the KSAP viewing area, getting some big time rain and even some thunderstorm activity this evening. Elsewhere, things are quiet. There was a cluster of thunderstorms coming out of Maverick County there, uh, moving into this Zavala County near Crystal City. That has really fallen apart, as you can see, not very impressive on radar at this time. So we'll be heading into the overnight hours on a rain free note and future cast is picking up on that activity up closer to the Austin area there. So we head into the overnight hours. We'll have cloudy skies around. It'll be warm. It'll be muggy out there and we'll start you off tomorrow morning, mainly just cloudy. I can't rule out a few little streamer showers here or there, especially off to the north and west of San Antonio, closer to the Edwards Plateau. But generally speaking, tomorrow will be a rain free day. We'll get some sun in the afternoon and that'll warm us up a bit more than where we were today. Now, what I want to draw your attention to not only for tomorrow, but also for again Tuesday afternoon and evening, the potential for some thunderstorm development over the higher terrain of northern Mexico and also in far west. West Texas. There'll be some better uh, thunderstorm making energy well off to our north and west. And as is sometimes the case, these thunderstorms will want to come off the mountains of Mexico, cross the border there, and then also a cluster of storms maybe up closer to the I-20 corridor trying to drop down to the southwest. And a couple of our forecast models are hinting at this possibility. So we get to this time tomorrow night. We'll be watching for the potential of some storms off to the northwest and then also some storms there closer to the border. As is usually the case, these will weaken before they could potentially make it to San Antonio. But if you're west of 35, some of our border counties there, uh, maybe even up in the hill country, something to consider. We may throw in a chance of a shower late tomorrow and tomorrow night. Uh, as we get closer to that time, so be sure to check the forecast tomorrow. But for San Antonio and for much of the area, uh, We'll be left with no rain for the next several days, and that does include tomorrow. So 76 in the morning, 94 in the afternoon. Could see an increase in high cloud cover if some of those storms get going over northern Mexico. That could toss us some high cloud cover. So a decent amount of uh, shade from Mother Nature during the day tomorrow, but it will still be plenty hot and humid. Uh, upper level high pressure has been sitting down to the south this weekend. That has what allowed the cloud cover to hang around, even some showers here or there, but it's going to move in closer this week. I guess a, a bit tighter and that's going to send our temperatures up closer to the triple digit mark as we approach the 4th of July holiday. As of now, the holiday next weekend just looks hot and sunny. We do have dense dust returning on Thursday. I know that's probably not, not what a lot of folks want to hear, but we're going to talk all about dust. We're going to have a little Q&A session coming up next half hour, so stick around for that, guys. A heat hug, huh? A heat hug. Yeah. Doesn't that sound nice? <laughs> I love that. It's too warm for that. <laughs> yeah, it's gross. We'll be right back. Former Cowboys wide receiver Des Bryant in San Antonio working out with some local kids. With more on what's on tonight's instant replay, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. Yeah, and we have breaking news tonight involving two school districts in the San Antonio area. The Justin and the Northeast School Districts are joining the Harlandale and Edgewood School Districts in shutting down their summer strength and conditioning camps due to the alarming rise in coronavirus positive tests in our area. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Man, I love being out here with you guys. You know, far, far, and around. It was fun. Fun. Learn from you guys. Not only was former Cowboys wide receiver Des Bryant in San Antonio over the weekend, he worked out with this group. and calls themselves a Duck Elite, a seven-on-seven -seven football team. He also gave them a pep talk after sharing the field. And current Cowboys running back Ezekiel Elliott is upset about a lawsuit filed against him after his three dogs allegedly attacked his pool cleaner. The latest on that and how the NFL Players Association president is pleading with current NFL stars such as Tom Brady to stop working out together during the COVID-19 pandemic. I haven't stopped watching the fight, you know, ever since. I keep watching the fight over and over. I feel like people are getting annoyed with me that I don't keep watching the fight, but I mean, 
I don't know. It's, it's just, it's still crazy to me. <laughs> Tonight is a night our Larry Ramirez is down with the champ. Just days after Joshua Franco brings on the WBA Super Flyweight belt. He won in Las Vegas last Tuesday night with a unanimous decision. The first half of that exclusive tonight from his grandmother's home on the city's west side. And baseball is back at the Wolf through the Flying Chocolates. Our Jessica Hunt will introduce us to the team of college baseball players, with many with local ties to San Antonio, to compete in a 30-game format beginning this week. Former Reagan, now Aggie quarterback Kellen Mond, continues his campaign to force changes on the A&M campus. All that plus, our Andrew Seeley and Jessica Hunt review the movie 42 in Championship Cinema. And should the UIL consider flip-flopping fall and spring sports tonight, you decide. Instant replay is live, and it's after the night beat. And, of course, that breaking news we got you too. Not looking good. Not at all. All right, thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. We'll see you again in a little bit. Coming up next on the night beat, President Trump this morning attacking the New York Times for reporting on intelligence that you, Russian spies sought to pay the Taliban to kill U.S. troops. More on his response, which is only drawing more criticism today. Plus, another look at this morning's lead essay interview with a local doctor who discussed the state of the pandemic in Bear County and why things could still get much worse. The president facing sharp criticism over his response to a New York Times report published this past Friday. That report stating Russia was looking to pay the Taliban to kill U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert with the details. President Trump responding today to a New York Times report that a Russian military unit secretly offered to pay the Taliban to kill American troops in Afghanistan. The Times also claiming President Trump was briefed on the findings. The president lashing out on Twitter, writing, nobody briefed or told me about so-called attacks on our troops in Afghanistan by Russia, adding, nobody's been tougher on Russia than the Trump administration. Last year, 23 U.S. troops died in Afghanistan, but whether any were targeted by Taliban fighters paid by Russian operatives is not known. A military official confirming to ABC News that Russian intelligence allegedly did offer to pay militants to kill U.S. service members, but did not know if the president had been briefed. This is as bad as it gets, and yet the president will not confront the Russians on this score. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on ABC's This Week telling George Stephanopoulos it was totally outrageous that the president did not respond to the intelligence reports. She would think uh, that the minute the president heard of it, he would want to know more instead of denying that he knew anything. She said top congressional leaders were not aware of the intelligence, but will be seeking answers to determine if the president was briefed. The president's former national security advisor telling CNN's Jake Tapper, the president's reaction shows his fundamental focus is not on national security, adding that if the president had not been briefed, he should have been asking questions as soon as the Times report came out call up the national security advisor, the director of national intelligence, somebody and said, what's going on here? What are the facts? Now, if that didn't happen in the last 48 hours, that in and of itself uh, is disturbing. Andrew Dimber, ABC News, Washington, D.C. President Trump also under fire today for retweeting a video featuring one of his supporters shouting white power at protesters. The video was apparently recorded during this pro-Trump 2020 golf cart parade at the Villages, which is a retirement community in Sumter County, Florida. At some point, that parade was met by protesters, both sides hurling insults at each other. In this tweet, the president thanked the great people supporting him. Senator Tim Scott, the only black Republican in the Senate, said the president should take the tweet down, which he did after a few hours. A White House spokesman claimed the president didn't hear the white power chant. Meanwhile, Starbucks is joining Unilever, Honda, and Coca-Cola in pausing its advertising on Facebook. The move comes as the giant coffee company holds internal discussions about stopping hate speech. A civil rights group recently launched an ad boycott against Facebook with the hashtag Stop Hate for Profit. Starbucks has not signaled it would formally join the effort, but the decision will put a particular financial pressure on Facebook, where Starbucks spent nearly $95 million last year. The company's action is far broader than what the civil rights group has been calling for. The Stop Hate for Profit campaign only called for a pause of ad spending on Facebook for the month of July. Another look outside with live cam still holding steady at 83 degrees with plenty of cloud cover and humidity out there and a little bit of Saharan dust does remain, but obviously today was just not nearly as hazy as yesterday. And as we look 
kick our Saharan dust outlook. A little bit of the dust does still remain over portions of Texas tonight. As we get into the day tomorrow, this dust will continue to thin out, and I think it'll look even less hazy on Monday. Unfortunately, though, down in the Gulf of Mexico, that dark brown color indicating very dense dust. A plume of that is going to start to sneak back in Tuesday into Wednesday, though we're still looking OK. I think it'll be Thursday that some denser dust really starts to build back into portions of San Antonio and South Texas. So that'll be coming later on this week, but we will get a break for a few days. Coming up in just a bit, I'm going to answer some of your questions about Saharan dust. So stick around for that, Tim. Thanks, Katie. Still ahead tonight, KSAT's interview with a local doctor who discusses the latest COVID-19 projection models and why things could still get much worse if we don't continue to follow safety guidelines. With COVID-19 case numbers hitting new daily highs in Bear County, many are left wondering how it will impact our daily lives in the coming weeks. Yeah, this morning on GMSA's Leading SA segment, Dr. Robert Leverance with UT Health San Antonio joined our anchors to discuss the significant increase. He also spoke about the grim projections indicated by some of the city's recent COVID-19 models. As we've been saying all morning here in Texas and around Bear County, we are seeing a surge in confirmed cases of COVID-19. In just the last week, the governor and our local leaders reinstating restrictions all in an effort to keep us safe from this pandemic. That's why this morning on Leading SA, we are joined by Dr. Robert Leverance with UT Health San Antonio. Good morning, Dr. Leverance. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being on, Doctor. Now, we are just hours after that record. 795 confirmed cases reported yesterday. So what do you take away from these latest numbers, and what is your message to our community? Yeah, Max, uh, this tells us that we're still in the thick of things. Uh, COVID is a highly infectious virus. Um, it still has the capacity to overwhelm our system, and we truly can't let up our efforts. I'm glad you just had a spot on testing. Testing is incredibly important. People have to know if they have the virus so they can adequately quarantine. And Dr. Lawrence, we had some viewers writing in wondering if the latest numbers are just from the increase in testing. However, we are also seeing a rise in hospitalizations and the use of ventilators. What are you seeing on the front lines? Yeah, I, I think both is true. Uh, we're seeing increased cases because of more testing. On the other hand, this is a very real surge. We have, oh, I think sevenfold of the number of patients hospitalized for COVID uh, in our hospitals in San Antonio compared to three weeks ago. You mentioned 730. We were under 100 uh, just three weeks ago. And I'll tell you, that has nothing to do with the amount of testing that's going on in the community. That just has to do with folks getting sick and needing help in our hospitals. And so already in our hospital, we've reestablished our emergency operations. We've implemented our backup plans. This has taken tremendous preparation and ongoing support. So, so this surge is uh, very, very real, and we need to take it very seriously. And you guys have a new model for the spread of the pandemic. What should our community know? Where we do have a, a predictive model and they have uh, matured at the beginning of this pandemic. I'm not sure they were very useful, but after uh, four months, we know this virus better. Uh, there's two local models here for San Antonio. One comes out of UTSA by Dr. Gutierrez, and then we have one at UT Health. And so it's good to have both because then you can compare them and validate them. Both models tell us that we're looking at another doubling of uh, hospitalizations by next week. Um, the models diverge a little bit after that, and it depends a little bit on what we all do. What I mean by that is if we're currently wearing our masks when we go out, staying home when we can, washing our hands regularly, not meeting in large groups, then hopefully we'll see a plateauing of these hospitalizations, not next week, next week's going to happen, but the week following. If we're not doing all of those things, then uh, we, we could be in store for a New York City type of a situation here. No question about it. That's what the models are predicting. And Dr. Leverin staying home for now, but many schools are set to start in just a couple of months, including fall sports training. Do you think it's safe to return by then? Boy, that's a, uh, that's a tough one. You know, right on the heels of this current wave is going to be most certainly uh, a fall wave, you know, an early winter wave. That's what we saw in the, the flu pandemic of 1918, and that's what most of us are expecting this fall. This current wave is probably going to last until August or September. And so um, 
I, I think for all of us individually, um, the best metaphor for this pandemic is a war against an invisible enemy. And our individual tour of duty is going to be probably another nine months. I don't know about you all, but I'm very tired of this virus. And I think most people are. But we all personally have to have a battle rhythm. In other words, take care of ourselves. You know, make sure you're exercising, you're eating right, spending time with loved ones virtually, perhaps, so that we can all have the energy to stay on guard, to keep wearing our masks, to keep washing our hands. I mean, this is what has to happen for the next probably nine months. So again, I, 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 to me, I don't think it's going to be safe um, to uh, open up for those kinds of public gatherings later this fall, but we'll find out. We'll find out. All right, Dr. Levins, thank you so much for joining us this morning. All right. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. Great conversation there. You can watch this interview again and all of our other leading essay interviews right now at KSAT.com. Just click leading essay under the news tab. After the break, we're going behind the scenes of Disney's hit musical Frozen 2 to see how the magic was made. Frozen 2 is the highest grossing animated film of all time, and to make that happen takes a lot of people doing a lot of hard work for a lot of years, as we see in the new Disney Plus docu-series Into the Unknown, making Frozen 2. And all those songs that get stuck in your head, those are written by married couple Kristen Anderson Lopez and Bobby Lopez, who tell me having cameras follow them around for the series was strange. All right, ready? Into the unknown. Writing for us is a is almost like a um, a private thing between a, a man and a woman. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when two people love each other very much, they go to the piano and they start creating music. Um, so it, it felt really weird. Among the inside stuff you'll see is a glimpse into the story trust process, where every few months while making the film, Disney assembles directors and writers from all its hits to tell you what's working and what's not. It's brutal. It's brutal, but it. It's necessary if you're gonna make movies that have to last centuries. But you'll also see some magical moments, like the first time the couple heard what would become the Oscar-nominated signature song, Into the Unknown, with a hundred-piece orchestra. Into the unknown. Moment where you hear this stuff for the first time live, and it just makes your skin crawl. It makes you, it gets, it gives you goosebumps. When it comes to creating Anna and Elsa and Olaf, some probably think it happens using actual magic. Going behind the scenes to watch how the sausage is made, is there any concern that might shatter the illusion? If you don't want to see um, how a magic trick happens, then maybe. <laughs> but who doesn't want to know how the magic trick happens? It doesn't make the magic any less. So are you guys ready for Frozen 3 now? <laughs> um, let's get out of this pandemic. Let's let's find a vaccine. Give me the vaccine and I'll write Frozen 3. How about that? Jason Ethanson, ABC News, Hollywood. I love Frozen. It's also making me feel annoyed yeah. that it's cold there and not here. <laughs> it's pretty cool to see the animation. Little known fact, I worked for Disney. Yes. Well before when I was in college and uh, worked in the animation department at MGM. <laughs> I think it was MGM Studios that's at that amazing. time. And gave tours. That's so I feel like that's a fact that people would not guess about. I could you. also tell you where the bathrooms are without pointing. <laughs> <laughs> it means you could it's probably work the weather wall. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Come on over any time. Ran random facts you didn't need to know. Come on over. Tim. I think Come everyone over. needs to know that Tim worked for Disney. I think that would shock a lot of people. This guy in the happiest place on earth. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> I love it. I think it fits perfectly. I think oh it fits perfectly. Uh, well, going from thinking frozen thoughts to dusty thoughts. Obviously, the dust has been around for a few days. It was at its worst yesterday. Got a little bit better today. But we've been getting a lot of questions on social media, even via email, about the dust. And I grabbed a few here. And I I thought this would be a good opportunity to maybe try to address some of your questions and with all these questions I'm a talker I could like really we could be here for like 30 minutes on these questions but obviously can't do that tonight so these are going to kind of be quick hitting but all these questions are addressed in depth in an article on ksat.com so question how does the dust make it all the way across the ocean without falling out of the sky first? I think that's valid because this dust has traveled thousands of miles from uh, the Saharan Desert region of Africa. So what happens here is that loose dust gets picked up into the atmosphere and it's carried all the way across the ocean by the trade winds. These in the northern hemisphere 
push this dust uh, from east to west there and the trade winds are a permanent feature so they keep going all the way across the Atlantic Ocean near the equator so think of it as like a hot potato game that dust it never gets dropped it just keeps getting carried and carried farther and farther across the ocean question two why doesn't this dust get all over everything in our cars in our houses like dust storms in West Texas. If you've never been through a West Texas dust storm or haboob, this may not make a whole lot of sense, but those storms can produce some really densely packed red dust and clay that gets in your car, in your homes, on the surfaces. So why doesn't that happen with this dust? Well, for a few reasons, the source regions are different. For the Saharan dust, of course, it's out of Africa. For Haboobs in the western United States there, it's the red dirt and clay in our westernmost states. Uh, the scale of these storms are also much different. The Saharan dust is on a much larger scale, thousands of miles. Uh, those Haboobs in far west Texas, they work on about the size of a thunderstorm because they're produced from thunderstorm outflows. But I think the biggest difference here, the Saharan dust can be spread out up to a mile up in our atmosphere, whereas that red dust in a west Texas Texas dust storm or haboob is very densely packed near the ground. And all right, the final question, the burning question, when is it going to leave? And I think that's a very valid question because it can be very irritating to folks when it's very dense like it was yesterday. Uh, so we looked at this just a few minutes ago. We'll continue to see this dust kind of clear out a bit as we get into the day tomorrow. I pressed the wrong button uh, as we get into the day tomorrow and even uh, as we get into Tuesday still won't be as bad, but we are expecting another fairly dense plume to move in here as we get into Thursday of this week. So as is kind of typical with this dust, it kind of goes through ebbs and flows. Some days are worse than others, but uh, we have this in the forecast for you through the at least the end of this week. And of course, we'll keep you updated. Uh, another quick check at radar since we last spoke. A few little showers have started to develop north of San Antonio there uh, into uh, a portion of Comal County right along 281 from Bull Verde up 281 there just to the west of Canyon Lake. These are some nice little showers, I, and I don't think they have a whole lot of energy behind them to sustain them much longer from where they are right now, but nonetheless, a few little sprinkles possible over the next couple of hours there in far northern Bear County and Kamau County tonight down to 76 cloudy and muggy, but also a little bit of a breeze there tomorrow. 94 your high temperature. We'll get to see some sun tomorrow. That will be nice, uh, but as far as rainfall goes, I think we've really seen the last of good rain chances at least for the next week or so. Fourth of July is looking hot. Surprise Did and you dry. <laughs> So, Tim, did you yeah. dress up as Disney characters at Disney? No, I did not, but I knew those that did. Even if he says no, I feel like it's a possibility. I did have to wear a little sailor's outfit for the <laughs> other the little mermaid thing. We're going to scrape up pictures of this, and I'm going to post them on my Perfect. Facebook page. We'll be right back. Should the NBA allow players to the option to post social justice messages on their uniforms instead of using their names during the league restart? It's one of the major topics that the sports guys will be talking about tonight. And Championship Cinema returns with a review of the movie 42 about the racial integration of professional baseball. With more on what's an instant replay, here's Greg Simmons. That is a great it's movie. A Looking great movie. forward to that. And before the month of June runs out, more sports anniversaries and include two Spurs championships and two major draft picks. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. <laughs> Tonight, Andrew Seeley and Jessica Hunt will review the movie 42 in Championship Cinema, the racial integration of professional baseball through Jackie Robinson, who wore the number 42. Tonight, facts about the movie you may not have known that includes just how many sports Jackie was able to play even professionally. And San Antonio FC is ready to restart its season with a new format and divisions designed to limit travel and build rivalries. The San Antonio Spurs select David Robinson from Navy. And before we close the book on June, more sports anniversary tonight to begin with the drafting of two of the top players in Spurs franchise history and ends with two more championships along the way. And after the FBI determined that Bubba Wallace was not the victim of a hate crime after their investigation of a rope in his garage, did NASCAR overreact? It's one of the major topics for the sports guys tonight. All that plus former Cowboys wide receiver Des Bryant right here in San Antonio works out with a local 7-on-17. Seven seven Hear what he has to say about that. Instant Replay is live and it is next. It's like a packed show. It's ready. All right, Greg, we'll it's see ready. you in just a bit. We'll be right back.